Chapter 32 Jacob's Ladder and Ten Commandments Jacob's Ladder Decoded The story of Jacob's Ladder is an ancient allegorical biblical tale, describing the alchemical process of reaching complete gnosis, or what some may call sainthood, Buddhahood or enlightenment. A symbolic ladder that we all must climb if we wish to reach the spiritual heights of the divine in the heavens while we are encased in physical matter here on earth. As we climb, we must purify ourselves, our thoughts, habits and actions so that we may reach that seventh and final step of our ascent, in order to activate all of our seven senses and DNA. Homer, the Greek author of both the Iliad and the Odyssey, who is revered as the greatest of ancient Greek epic poets had described Jacob's ladder as Jupiter's chain reaching from heaven to earth, as it relates to the divine providence. This description of Jupiter's chain by Homer is the key to the mystery surrounding Jacob's ladder, that I feel deserves much more investigation than it has received and that needs to be expanded upon to truly grasp the reality of this ancient mystery, which I hope to accomplish below. Albert Pike had written in Morals and Dogma, the ladder by which it rescinds, has, according to Marsilius Ficinus, in his commentary on the Ennead of Plotinus, seven degrees or steps. And in the mysteries of Mithras carried to Rome under the emperors, the ladder with its seven rounds was a symbol referring to this ascent through the spheres of the seven planets. To grasp the secret truths behind the hidden mystery of Jupiter's chain, we first must study the description of Jacob's ladder which appears in Genesis 28 10-19. Jacob left Beersheba, and went toward Haran. He came to the place and stayed there that night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it or beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your descendants. And your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And by you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth bless themselves. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done that of which I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid, and said, This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Clues to the stone decoded in Dante The famous Italian poet of the Middle Ages Dante leaves us more clues to Jacob's ladder in his allegorical description of sin in a divine comedy. While Dante is asleep, he dreams that he is in Troy when an eagle with golden feathers swoops down snatching him up as far as the fire, where he begins to burn. As Dante slept, a character described as a shining-eyed Saint Lucy picks him up from the valley. On Dante's awakening, Virgil explains that while Dante was asleep, Lucy, in 2.97-102, had borne him from the valley of the princes to the steps of the gate of purgatory. The eagle tells Dante that God's justice is not man's. The damnation of those who never heard of Christ is just. The princes of the world though profess believers, may well be damned. The eagle is the planet Jupiter. Dante tells us, Jupiter is where rulers eminent for justice are disposed in the shape of an eagle representing Earth's noblest kings and potentates. The eagle. Since ancient times has been a symbol of the planet Jupiter, the eagle with golden feathers swooping down to snatch up Dante is akin to the angels ascending down the ladder from heaven to earth in the story of Jacob's ladder, and what Homer had described as Jupiter's chain. The eagle then takes Dante as far as the fire. Lucy is Lucifer and the phosphorus in our DNA. If the eagle is an angel or spirit representing the planet Jupiter, then this fire Dante sees or feels must come from or be in the realm of this giant gas planet which then leads us to the shining-eyed Saint Lucy. Lucy in relation to Dante, is described by Virgil as the one who has borne him from the valley of the princes to the steps of the gate of purgatory. The key words above are fire and Saint Lucy. Lucy is very similar to Lucifer, which is just Latin for the Greek phosphoros, or phosphorus. A name meaning light bringer, is the morning star. Lucy or Lucifer, the morning star is often associated with Venus, but not this Lucifer or morning star. This Lucy is connected to the other morning star that is the planet Jupiter which contains. Guess what element? Yes, you guessed it, there is phosphorus, 
or what we can call Lucifer on the planet Jupiter and its moons like Io. It is a scientific fact that there is a great red spot on the planet Jupiter caused by complex organic molecules, red phosphorus. Phosphorus and H atoms to form penthouse 3 have been observed in the stratosphere of Jupiter. This same chemical energy is also the least abundant element cosmically relative to its presence in biology says Matthew Posick of the University of South Florida. I have written about phosphorus and Lucifer before, where I have explained that phosphorus is essential for life, and the phosphate is a component of DNA, RNA, ATP, and also the phospholipids that form all cell membranes. Simply put, without phosphorus we humans would simply not be human because our consciousness and our spiritual energy would not exist. It is through our DNA which contains phosphorus, that we become conscious to the world and who we are in order to live in the light. Hence, when Jacob lied down on the stone, or the fire that Dante sees that is called Lucy, and what Homer had said was Jupiter's chain, is in fact just allegories to describe phosphorus which resides in our DNA. Jacob's pillow is the philosopher's stone. Phosphorus is also the philosopher's stone that is the central symbol of alchemy symbolizing the light within our DNA and in nature. Phosphorus is commonly found in inorganic phosphate rocks and is the body's source of chemical energy. The phosphorus atom is of the nitrogen family, but having that characteristic of firing. Without phosphorus, there would be no thought or wisdom. This is the atom that fires our blood to produce chemical energy, consciousness, creativity and life. It is the fiat lux of all nature. Hence, this is the fire Dante had saw in his dreams and is described as Lucy. Jupiter's chain is our DNA. When Homer had described Jupiter's chain, he could not have been writing about an actual physical chain that connects from Earth to Jupiter. This would be impossible since the giant gas planet is approximately 601 million miles, 968 million km, away. Therefore, Homer must have been giving us clues that this chain was something that is hidden or metaphysical but that does relate to the planet Jupiter. The giant gas planet I have written about quite a few times on this blog with articles such as Jupiter, Father of Men and Lord of the Heavens and what is Nibiru? The god of the sky called in mythology Nibiru by the Sumerians, Marduk by the Babylonians, Zeus by the Greeks, Yahweh and Adonai by the Israelites and Saint Peter by the Catholics. When I look at DNA and what Watson called the double helix, it looks like a twisted ladder, a ladder that reminds me of the story of Jacob's ladder in the Bible, where in his dreams there was a ladder from earth that stretched to heaven where the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Could it be that Homer was alluding to the fact that the planet Jupiter may be where we humans originate from, and that this chain is our connection to the spirit in the heavens via our DNA double helix that the ancients had concealed in the allegory of Jacob's ladder or Jupiter's chain. This may be exactly what Homer and the fathers and doctors of the church were referring to in the allegorical tale of Jacob's ladder, the ladder of DNA that contains the light of God, via the chemical energy river of past life memories that flows through our bodily organs such as our brain into our Ammon's horn in order to access the inner gnosis encoded in our very DNA ladder. A ladder that rests on your spinal column and pulsates through the faculties on the mind here on earth that extends its spirit to the heavens. We must climb this ladder step by step to ascend to the light, and never miss a crucial rung of initiation on our path. The steps of DNA activation viaduct Jacob's ladder with the help of Manly P. Hall. The first step of Jacob's ladder is the personal purification of your body mind and soul that is represented by the moon. The second rung on the ladder is education intelligence managed by Mercury. The third step is beauty represented by Venus. The fourth rung is the sun, which is the life giver. The fifth is competition by Mars to help us fight the good fight. The fight against darkness with light, against lies with truth. The sixth rung in the ladder is Jupiter which is the symbol of intellectual maturity and judgment. The seventh and last step of the ladder is Saturn which represents the true sage adept and master of wisdom, the perfect balance of spiritual and material laws. All greatness is service and we must obey the laws of leadership. Jacob's Ladder Facts Before the advent of Christianity, in Babylonia, Ishtar descends through the seven gates which led downward into the depths of the underworld. It was the ladder of the Mithras, a common symbol in Mithraic art in which the candidate went through seven stages of initiation. The Hellenistic Jewish biblical philosopher Philo Judeus, born in Alexandria, D. K. 50 CE, in the first book of his Dasamis wrote, The angels represent souls descending to and ascending from bodies. Some consider this to be Philo's clearest reference to the doctrine of reincarnation. St. Irenaeus, 
in the second century describes the Christian church as the ladder of ascent to God. In the third century, Origen explains that there are two ladders in the life of a Christian, the ascetic ladder that the soul climbs on the earth, by way of and resulting in an increase in virtue, and the soul's travel after death, climbing up the heavens towards the light of God. The Purpose and Meaning of the Ten Commandments Before looking at the purpose and meaning of these ten magnificent laws of love, it should be noted that there really is only one passage we need to know that demonstrates the unchanging, eternal nature of ALL the Ten Commandments. Matthew 5 17-18 reads, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Tell heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. See verses from the NIRV Bibline the CEV Bible and Luke's account. Those unfortunate Christians that have been led astray by the ruler of this world have only one response to attempt to nullify this verse, which is that Jesus fulfilling the law brings an end to the law. The NIRV explains the meaning of fulfill in these words, I have come to give full meaning to what is written and the CEV reads, I did not come to do away with them, but to give them their full meaning. There are several scriptures that use the same Greek word as what is translated fulfill in verse 17, and Matthew 3.15 is one example, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. If the fulfilling of the law brings an end to the law, then righteousness, God's word, obedience, joy and other things eternal in nature are also gone. This of course is obviously not so. And so neither are the Ten Commandments abolished. Not only that but who could ever think that Jesus was abolishing the law after instructing us that we should not only obey the law but teach it as well. Put simply, unless Jesus is contradicting his word, and heaven and earth are still here, then all Ten Commandments have to remain including the Fourth Commandment. It is that simple. Isaiah 42:21 says the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law, and make it honorable. In the remainder of Matthew chapter 5 we see how Jesus has indeed magnified the law. We note the following. Matthew 5:19 from not only obeying the law but teaching it also, 5:21 to 22 from do not kill to not being angry with your brother without cause, 5:27 to 28 from do not commit adultery to being guilty if you look at a woman lustfully, 5:31 from divorcing by a letter to any man who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality causes her or anyone who marries a divorced woman to commit adultery, 533-37 from not breaking oaths made to the Lord to do. Not swear at all either by heaven or earth or by Jerusalem. And do not swear by your head, let your yes be yes, and your no, no. 538-42 from an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth to turning the other cheek and if someone sues you for your coat, give them your cloak also. 543 to 45 from love your neighbor and hate your enemy to love your enemies and bless them that curse you and pray for those that are spiteful and use you. Does it sound like Jesus is destroying the law? Certainly not. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is to point out sin as Paul informs us in Romans 7 7 and note Paul is expressing this long after the cross. Below you will find more on the meaning of each commandment in brief with the option of reading much more detail if required. The first commandment is about loyalty. The creator of the universe declares he is our God and our deliverer and asks us to demonstrate our love for him by having no other gods. The first commandment is the first of a series of four that define our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Establishing, developing and maintaining that personal relationship with a true and living God is the most important commitment we can ever make. That is the primary focus of the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. We should love honor and respect him so much that he alone is the supreme authority and model in our lives. He alone is God. We should allow nothing to prevent us from serving and obeying him. The second commandment is about worship. The one and only true God loves us so much that he is jealous of our love and does not want to share our love by us bowing down to meaningless idols. The second commandment goes to the heart of our relationship with our creator. It deals with several crucial questions. How do we perceive God? How do we explain him to ourselves and to others? About of all, what is the proper way to worship the only true God? The second commandment is a constant reminder that only we, of all created things, are made in the image of God. Only we can be transformed into the spiritual image of Christ, who of course came in the flesh as the perfect spiritual image of our Heavenly Father. This commandment protects our special relationship with our Creator 
who made us in his likeness and is still molding us into his spiritual image. The third commandment is about reverence. God asks us to respect his holy name and not to use it in vain. The third commandment focuses on showing respect. It addresses the way we communicate our feelings about God to others and to him. It encompasses our attitudes speech and behavior. Respect is the cornerstone of good relationships. The quality of our relationship with God depends on the love and regard we have for Him. It also depends on the way we express respect for Him in the presence of others. We are expected always to honor who and what He is. Conversely, the use of God's name in a flippant, degrading or in any way disrespectful manner, disnurs the relationship we are supposed to have with him. This can vary from careless disregard to hostility and antagonism. It covers misusing God's name in any way. The Hebrew name for vain is Shah and means vanity, falsehood, iniquity and emptiness. Simply summed up, Shah means showing disrespect and this is what we do when we take God's name in vain. The fourth commandment is about sanctification and relationship. God starts off the fourth commandment with the word remember. This is because he knew we would forget it. God asks that we keep it set apart for holy purposes so we can draw nearer to him. The fourth commandment to remember the Sabbath concludes the section of the Ten Commandments that specifically helps define the proper relationship with God, how we are to love worship and relate to him. It explains why and when we need to take special time to draw closer to our Creator. It is also a special sign between us and God forever, that it is him that sanctifies us whom alone we belong to and worship. The Sabbath, the seventh day of the week was set apart by God as a time of rest and spiritual rejuvenation. So why is this commandment so frequently ignored? attacked and explained away by so many. Could it be because the challenges to the Sabbath commandment are views generated by the ruler of this present evil world? After all, this being wants us to accept these views because he hates God's law. He does all he can to influence us to ignore, avoid and reason our way around it. On our calendar the Sabbath day begins at sunset Friday evening and ends at sunset Saturday evening. The fifth commandment is about respect for parental authority. God instructs us to show love for our parents by honoring them. The fifth commandment introduces us to a series of commandments that define proper relationships with other people. The fifth through to the tenth serve as the standards of conduct in areas of human behavior that generate the most far-reaching consequences on individuals. Families, groups and society. Families are the building blocks of societies that build strong nations. When families are fractured and flawed, the sad results are tragic and reflected in newspaper headlines every day. Any individual or group, including whole nations that understand the importance of strong families reap the rewards of an improved relationship and blessings from God. The fifth commandment shows us from whom and how the fundamentals of respect and honor are most effectively learned. It guides us to know how to yield to others, how to properly submit to authority and how to accept the influence of mentors. That is why the Apostle Paul wrote, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Ephesians 6 2-3 The sixth commandment is about respect for human life. God asks us to demonstrate love and not hate towards others by not murdering. We must learn to control our tempers. Taking another person's life is not our right to decide. That judgment is reserved for God alone. That is the thrust of this commandment. God does not allow us to choose to willfully or deliberately take another person's life. The sixth commandment reminds us that God is the giver of life and heal alone has the authority to take it or to grant permission to take it. God wants us to go far beyond avoiding murder. He requires that we not maliciously harm another human being in word or deed. This is why John wrote, Whosoever had it as brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3:15. God desires that we treat even those who choose to hate us respectfully and do all within our power to live in peace and harmony with them. He wants us to be builders not destroyers of good relationships. To accomplish this we must respect this wonderful gift of this precious possession, human life. The seventh commandment is about purity in relationships. God asks us to express and demonstrate our love for our partner by not committing adultery. Adultery is the violation of the marriage covenant by willful participation in sexual activity with someone other than one's spouse. Since God's law sanctions sexual relationships only within a legitimate marriage, the command not to commit adultery covers in principle, all varieties of sexual immorality. No sexual relationship of any sort should occur outside of marriage. That is the crux of this commandment. Most of us need the support and companionship of a loving spouse. We need someone special who can share our ups and downs, 
triumphs and failures. No one can fill this role like a mate who shares with us a deep love and commitment. Society suffers because we have lost the vision that God had for marriage from the beginning. Marriage is not a requirement for success in pleasing God, but it is a tremendous blessing to couples who treat each other as God intended. Most people desire and need the benefits that come from a stable marriage. To return to what God intended, we must give marriage the respect it deserves. The Eighth Commandment is about honesty. God instructs us to show our love and respect for others by not stealing what belongs to them. The Eighth Commandment safeguards everyone's right to legitimately acquire and own property. God wants that right honored and protected. His approach to material wealth is balanced. He wants us to prosper and enjoy physical blessings. He also expects us to show wisdom in how we use what He provides us and He does not want possessions to be our primary pursuit in life. When we see material blessings as a means to achieve more important objectives. God enjoys seeing us prosper. To Him it is important that generosity rather than greed motivate the choices we make. Because they are qualities of His own character, He asks that we, from the heart, put giving and serving ahead of lavishing possessions on ourselves. The ninth commandment is about truthfulness. God says if we love others we should not deceive or lie to them. How important is truth? The Bible says that Jesus is the way and the truth. John 14 6. To fully appreciate the ninth commandment with his prohibition of lying, we must realize how important truth is to God. Jesus Christ said of God the Father, your word is truth. John 17:17. 17, 17. The Bible throughout teaches that God is not a man, that he should lie numbers 23:19 as the source of truth god requires that his servants always speak truthfully under god's inspiration king david wrote lord who may dwell in your sanctuary who may live on your holy hill he whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the lord who keeps his oath even when it hurts Psalms 15 1-3, NIV. God expects truth to permeate every facet of our lives. Everything in the life of a Christian is anchored to truth. God wants us as his children, to commit ourselves to truth and reflect it in everything we do. The Tenth Commandment is about contentment. God instructs us not to covet because he knows it can entrap us into even greater sin. To covet means to crave or desire especially in excessive or improper ways. The Tenth Commandment does not tell us that all of our desires are immoral. It tells us that some desires are wrong. Coveting is an immoral longing for something that is not rightfully ours. That is usually because the object of our desire already belongs to someone else. But coveting can also include our wanting far more than we would legitimately deserve or that would be our rightful share. The focus of the Tenth Commandment is that we are not to illicitly desire anything that already belongs to others. The opposite of coveting is a positive desire to help others preserve and protect their blessings from God. We should rejoice when other people are blessed. Our desire should be to contribute to the well-being of others, to make our presence in their lives a blessing to them. The last of the Ten Commandments is aimed directly at the heart and mind of every human being. In prohibiting coveting, it defines not so much what we must do but how we should think. It asks us to look deep within ourselves to see what we are on the inside. As with each of the previous nine commandments, it is directed toward our relationships. It specifically deals with the thoughts that threaten those relationships and can potentially hurt ourselves and our neighbors. Therefore, it is fitting that the formal listing of these ten foundational commands, which define the love of God, should end by focusing on our hearts as the wellspring of our relationship problems. From within come the desires that tempt us and lead us astray. The magician. You have the potential to make things happen. The key to take control of your life is to have a vision and then take action to make it happen. Intention and action are both required. When your intentions and action are aligned, real magic occurs. Start gathering the resources you need to meet your goals. The universe is empowering you to manifest your vision. Take advantage of this opportunity by staying focused on your goals and applying your power.